Hi, my name is Sam Stone, and I'm the head of product from the pricing group at Opendoor. Excited to be talking to you today about building great machine learning products and some lessons we've learned. I'll start by talking about what are decision products. Then I'll go on and give a little bit of a brief background about Opendoor. And then I'll spend most of my time talking about three specific lessons that we've learned about how to build better decision products. What are decision products? Well, put simply, it's any product that helps you make a decision aimed at serving an internal or external customer better. For example, what content is a user most interested in seeing? Or how should we price this product to balance supply and demand? Or how can I help retain this customer? Note that when we talk about decision products, these are applications of machine learning at the user level. There are another level beyond machine learning primitives, for example, pure text recognition or computer vision. You might be wondering why I'm calling them decision products rather than just algorithms or models. At the end of the day, they're all the same thing under the hood. But I'm using the term decision product very intentionally because it makes clear that these, these types of products need the attention of product managers just as much as any UI-based product does. It's really important that product managers focus on decision products because they're not just technical challenges. They also present all sorts of business, design, policy, and even ethical challenges. If you've been reading the news over the past few years, you're probably well aware that AI products have presented all sorts of biases that have ramifications not just for their own companies, but for society at large. Before I dive in to some of the lessons that we've learned, I want to just give a brief overview of Opendoor. Uh, we'll be drawing from a lot of examples uh, from Opendoor, and so it's helpful to be a little bit familiar with what we do as a company. When Opendoor launched in 2014, we created an entirely new real estate service called Instant Buying or iBuying. Since then, we've nearly served we served nearly 80,000 home sellers and buyers, selling over $10 billion worth of homes. So, what is iBuying? Well, it's a problem, it's, it's a solution that gets after the user problem that selling a home the traditional way of hiring a realtor, or putting it on the market, uh, it's highly uncertain, it's highly time consuming, and it's very expensive. You have to do a bunch of repairs to your home, you have to uh, vacate it while you do open houses, and then it can take months to even get an offer, and that offer might not be any good. So the solution that Open Door offers is to go to our website, enter your address, answer just a few questions, and receive a competitively priced offer on your home very, very quickly. And it's an offer that you can take to the bank. It saves you the hassle of having to, to list your home. A couple things to note here. Um, after we've purchased a home, Opendoor does some light renovations, and then we try to resell the home as quickly and as profitably as we can. And we actually own the home. Uh, it goes on our balance sheet. We're not just a middleman. And we make or lose money um, in two ways. First, we charge a transaction fee to home sellers. And second, uh, we actually uh, profit or lose money depending on whether the, the home appreciates or depreciates. We use decision products in many ways. For example, uh, recommending homes that buyers may be interested in viewing from our own inventory. Or when it comes to pricing, figuring out how much we should offer to pay for a particular home that a seller wants to, to sell to us. Um, or for example, uh, how should we focus our marketing and our customer support resources across a very large universe of homeowners? So in the course of building these decision products, we've learned a couple of different things. The first one that I, that I wanna start with is know your user and your data. They're very different. Then we'll go on and we'll talk about nailing your North Star metric and finally, we'll wrap up by talking about how to regularly reconsider the rules of the game that underlie your decision products. So knowing your user and your data, what does that actually mean? Well, the first thing here is to start with the real world, not the data. So if you take a look at these two kitchens, uh, hopefully it's fairly obvious that these homes are not identical. Uh, the home on the left has some very dated looking wood cabinets, uh, they appear to be straight from like the 1950s or 60s. Um, the, the appliances are, are pretty old. Um, the home on the right has a much sleeker, more modern look. If you just looked at the data, though, uh, it would tell you that these kitchens and these homes overall are identical. 
They have the same square footage, the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms. They're actually built in the same year. Uh, it just happens to be that the home on the right, the owner uh, updated it more recently, but not in a way that, that uh, typical listings data captures. And the, the issue here is that if you, if you start from the data that's easily quantified, that's easily fed into your model, you're not going to pick up on these things that actually matter a lot to your users. Instead, we found it's much better to talk to users, to understand what they care about, even if it's not easily quantified in the data. It's obvious that data needs to be updated. What's less obvious is that the structure of data also needs to be updated regularly, and sometimes quite suddenly. For example, in one of our larger markets, our pricing accuracy had been ticking up slowly but surely until mid-2017, when all of a sudden we saw a major drop. It wasn't overnight, but it was over the course of a few months, and it was pretty worrisome. We checked all of our systems, and we couldn't find any bugs in the code. So then we started talking to home sellers and buyers in that market, and we learned about something that was significantly coloring their view of the market, but that our pricing model simply wasn't capturing. A recent hurricane had damaged thousands of homes. So all of a sudden, storm damage, or even suspicion of storm damage, had emerged as a key factor in buyers' willingness to pay. Storm damage had not been an important factor historically, so our model still looked good when back-tested against history. But the model was performing poorly in this new, storm-affected reality. Once we understood how buyers' preference structure had changed, the fix was simple. Ask sellers if their home had sustained storm damage recently and price accordingly. But to get there, we had to realize that we had to change the structure of our data. The final part of knowing your user and your data and how they're different is to understand the layers between the algorithm and the user. It's common for the UI in which an algorithm's results are displayed to be owned by a team downstream of the decision product team itself. It's important that the decision product team understands all of the details of that UI. When it comes to open door and how we send offers to buy a home from a seller, we explain our offer using comparable sales, otherwise known as comps. We found it helps build sellers' trust that their offer from Open Door is competitive. In addition to ensuring that our decision product generates an accurate offer price, this means we need to make sure it reveals the comps that factored into that price. If we ignored the UI and kept the comps hidden, we still could produce an accurate price. And in fact, there may be ways that we could even slightly increase our accuracy by doing things that don't use comps. However, we would have missed the opportunity to strengthen the trust with our customers through this transparency that's so key to our business. The second big lesson that we've learned at Open Door is that when it comes to decision products, it's essential to nail our North Star metric. Decision products can lead to mass proliferation of metrics. This is just a partial list of metrics that I pulled out of my own email inbox from the past couple of weeks. For a lot of these, it's relatively esoteric what the metric means and unclear how it ties to the business. However, not all metrics are created equal. And there's one metric that we think that everyone who's working with a decision product needs to understand deeply, regardless of whether they're a product manager, an engineer, a data science, tough scientist, or even a designer. And that's what we call the training metric. And I'll refer to that also as the North Star metric as we move forward. To understand what I mean here, let's spend a minute going into what's under the hood of a learned algorithm. An algorithm or a model takes in historical data, which includes inputs, sometimes called independent variables or features, and outputs, sometimes called dependent variables or labels. It then learns a relationship between those inputs and outputs, and it tries to minimize the error of its predictions versus the historical ground truth outcomes. The specifics of the historical ground truth and that definition of error are critically important. That definition of error is what we call the training metric or the, the, the training error. It's the crux of the model. And if it's not aligned with the fundamentals of the business and what the user needs, it's not something that can be overcome downstream. The model is really bad at its core. Here's an example of how to choose the wrong North Star training metric. When we first started building a recommendation product for home shoppers, we optimized the algorithm for clicks. So it showed homes like the mansion on the left. Super fun to look at, but no one's going to buy these homes unless you're a billionaire. A better approach was to focus our model 
on sellers that are buyers that would actually make an offer on a home, not just click on the listing. That ended up showing homes that looked a lot more like those on the right, a lot more modest, but also a lot more realistic. They got fewer clicks, but they ended up getting many more offers. And that's ultimately what leads to higher sales, which is what matters for our users and for our business. The place to start is with the right training metric. But going beyond that, we've learned to put monitoring in in multiple places in our data product design. Let's expand on the training view of a decision product to include the serving or live production element of this product. We train our model on historical data where outcomes are known, while we serve on live data where the ground truth is not known. The first metric we monitor is what I just described, accuracy from model training, an assessment of how well the model can understand past data. But this is not enough. We also need to check our inputs, our live data, and our outputs. I'll go into it a bit of detail on both. Let's start with monitoring our inputs. A key assumption of algorithms is that their production or live serving environment looks similar to their training environment. That means it's also important to make sure that their live serving data doesn't shift in unexpected or illegitimate ways versus the historical training data. Here's an example of how that went wrong at Open Door. Like many such investigations, it began with us noticing that our back-tested accuracy had suddenly degraded. After doing some digging, one of our data scientists put together this perplexing chart. It showed that most homes listed in the market had a nice normal distribution centered on about $300,000. But recently, there had been a small group of listings that were way cheaper that were appearing just over our minimum price threshold of $50,000. So what was going on with these homes being listed for only $50,000? Were these incredible deals, you might be wondering? Well, not, not exactly. It turns out they were, in fact, listed for $50,000, but they weren't for sale. That was the monthly rent. It turns out we weren't filtering out rental listings as opposed to for sale listings because we had just excluded listings less than $50,000, and we had assumed that there would never be any rentals for more than $50,000 a month in this market. And now that prices had appreciated over the past few years, that assumption had been violated, and our model was totally confused by what it perceived to be extravagant mansions being sold for just $50,000. The immediate fix here was to filter out rentals, but the longer-term fix that was applied more broadly was to check the shape of the distribution of our inputs and make sure it wasn't changing that much day over day or week over week. The last part of this is monitoring our outputs. We want to monitor our live predictions, which are used to send out offers to homeowners who want to sell their home to Open Door. Evaluating any one live prediction is very hard. Our algorithm always thinks its prediction is good, but how can we actually tell? If the seller accepts the offer, that probably means it's not too low, but maybe it's too high. And if a seller rejects the offer, that probably means it's not too high, but maybe they rejected it for some other reason beyond it being too low. When it comes to evaluating any one offer or user session, it's a bit like rolling a single die. However, when we, can, we can get a better idea of our live algorithm's output by looking at offers in aggregate, for example, by hour or by day. While we don't know the right answer for any particular offer, we have a reasonable idea of ground truth in the aggregate. If too few offers are accepted, we prob we're probably biased low. And if too many offers are accepted, we're probably biased high. So we set up distribution checks, which alert our team if a group of offers behaves significantly differently from our expectations. The third and final lesson that we've learned at Open Door revolves around regularly reconsidering the rules of the game, how we actually use our decision products to interact with users. Let's go back to the data product diagram we've been using. At Open Door, this is how, for a very long time, we actually thought about our offer pricing products with the addition of the raw data component at the bottom. We were so confident in this that we set up a roadmap framework where we can improve our products in four ways. Get more or better raw data, extract more from the raw data, improve the model architecture, or improve the infrastructure, the piping between the, uh, the different parts here. And we thought this was mutually exclusive and completely exhaustive, that it would cover any possible way of improving this decision product 
and ultimately the, the user experience that was associated with it. But what we had forgotten was that we define this structure for quantifying and predicting interactions with our users. It's not necessarily or inherently right, and that we can actually change this structure. It turns out it was missing something pretty important. It was missing seller feedback. This is how our customers feel when we send them an offer that's too low. For most people, their home is their single largest financial asset, and they're pretty attuned to how valuable it is. And so when Open Door comes back with an offer that they believe is unfair, they're normally pretty peeved. Let me talk a little bit about how that might happen. Um, because a lot of the time, the seller is actually right. Our offer may be too low, and we're going to lose the deal. Um, let's imagine that the blue home on the left is our customer's home. Its value is determined by the recent sales of comparable homes or comps, comps number one, number two, and number three, all of which are in its neighborhood. We can see that the prices are increasing over time with respect to the comps, and that the most recent comp had a really good outcome. It sold for $200,000 just one week ago. That might even be why this seller is coming to us now. The seller saw that their neighbor sold for a great price really recently, and they want to see if they can get something similar. But maybe our algorithm is missing this data on comp number one. Maybe one of our ingestion jobs failed to run over the past few days, and it turns out we're actually blind to comp number one. Well, this is an instance where we're making a mistake, but our seller is really aligned with our incentives. The seller wants that higher offer, and we want to be able to do business with the seller, and we won't be able to do that unless we can fix this issue. So, this insight helped us understand there's a better structure for this decision product, which relies on after we've made a prediction and actually served up an offer to the seller, getting that customer's feedback, and then turning this linear flow into a loop, taking that feedback, turning it back into raw data, processing it and understanding if the feedback is actually valid from the customer, and then serving up a new prediction if that's what is warranted. To recap, we found three things to be key when it comes to building good decision products. First, know your user and your data. They're different. And ultimately, what's most important is how your user perceives the world. Start from there, not with the things that are most easily quantified and put into a model. Second, nail your North Star metric. Really understand what the definition of error that your model is trying to minimize is and make sure that that is consistent with what matters to your users and your business. And third, regularly reconsider the rules of the game. Understand how your decision product quantifies an interaction with a user and make sure that that interaction is defined in a way that actually allows you to help the user best. Building good decision products is not easy and the stakes are high since poorly designed decision products can have deeply negative effects on both businesses and society at large. But the lessons discussed today can give you more confidence that your decision products are making good choices. Since Open Door's founding, we've built our business around decision products. We expect the role of algorithms and machine learning will only continue to grow, especially as we expand our products and our user base and our mission to empower everyone with the freedom to move. I hope you found this session helpful and I'm looking forward to taking your live questions. Thanks.